Now that we're back in Germany, this picture is actually from 2023 that we were here. Uh, thanks for Humboldt uh, University to hosting us a second time. And this is, uh, this is kind of a screenshot from a little bit earlier or a picture from a little bit earlier this week. So hi, I'm Fred. I'm the product manager for Big Blue Button and I'm also the co-founder of Big Blue Button Inc. And I put here, I moonlight as the CEO of Blindside Networks. This is the company that started the Big Blue Button project a little way back. And just for anybody of you who have stumbled across this video on YouTube and wondering what is Big Blue Button, uh, we are a platform for delivering effective virtual classrooms or classes, and I will talk about that in a moment. And literally, well, how would you define an effective virtual class? Well, it's increasing learning outcomes. Did students join and did they learn? All right, so I'm going to step back for a moment and just sometimes I get asked why Big Blue Button exists. And can anybody t online type in the chat and tell me what this is? What is this picture? Okay, close, keep going. Earth, yeah, Jay Lopez, Earth. But you gotta pull way back. You gotta pull like back to the edge of the solar system. So that's Carl Sagan's uh, pale blue dot. And that's all we've got. Like we are alone, we are this little tiny island in the universe. And that's us right there. That's what Voyager saw just before it turned around and left our solar system. So um, things aren't going so well. Um, so the UNESCO Sustainability Development Goal, number four is access to quality education. That means everybody in the world, our goal is to have access. We can't raise ourselves without raising everybody else. And UNESCO, the data shows that currently there are 250 million kids that are not attending school. And globally that represents 16% of children and youth, uh, primary, primary, secondary. At the primary level, like one out of every 10 children worldwide. This is just not the world that we want to live in. We have got to get education to everybody. And now Big Blue Button can do some small part of that. And this is a really good goal to have. But ultimately, if we can help one kid somewhere in the world uh, raise themselves, their family, their community, their school, um, we are making a difference. So I mentioned Big Blue Button started. So it started in 2007 at Carleton University. And this is where it is till 2023. And it's come a long way since then. And we continue to focus on online education. And of course, we're broadening, we, we have also been used in other use cases, which I'll talk about. Okay, so this is how we look at Big Blue Button and what the challenges are for the virtual classroom. So uh, a lot of times virtual classes were taught using traditional video conferencing systems. The goal of these systems is to meet. It's not the goal of the virtual classroom. The goal is not to meet, the goal is to learn. And if video was all you needed, then why were so many of the classes taught during COVID so bad? It's just because there's just more that has to happen in a virtual class for it to be effective. And if you think about Big Blue Button, uh, it's really worth pointing out we are open source. It's why we're here today. It's why we have the global community. Thanks to that community, we're localized into over 55 languages around the world. Uh, we have over 150 developers worldwide. And we have really deep integrations with the world's learning management systems like Moodle, Canvas, Schoology, Genzabar, uh, Camellia Populous, Sakai, and lots of others. And we believe open source is the way to reach the world. Moodle showed that. It is the world's most popular learning management system. And it is all open source. And there's some things that Moodle did that we're kind of looking to do ourselves. I always like to bring this up. This was a couple of years ago, baden Wittenberg. Uh, they had set up... 4,000 Big Blue Button servers to service 3,000 schools. And there was 185,000 concurrent teachers and students at, many, at some times. That's all with open source. They were able to do it themselves. They were able to scale to that. And that was the power of what we built out with Big Blue Button and the open source tools around it. So I'm gonna talk about three things. Framework, uh, sort of thinking about effective virtual classes, Big Blue Button itself and the future. So. When you design a product as complex as Big Blue Button, it's, a, it's too contrast. You have to master the complexity and you have to make it simple for users. The only way you can do that is have like a framework in your mind of what it is that we're building. What is going to build an effective virtual class? So what we did is we sat down and we came up with all these creative ideas of what Big Blue Button should do for effective teaching and learning. No, there's already like 50 years, 70 years of effective pedagogy. So I always say this, like, imagine you were defining a worldwide class. 
or world-class online school, and you wanted students to say, that was the best virtual class I've ever taken. How would you achieve this? Well, you'd probably be well served by just going back and looking at 65 years of pedagogy, the science of teaching and learning. And it kind of starts with this diagram. So uh, I would usually make this really interactive with the class, but I kind of want to go through the content. So I'll, I'll share with you, this is Bloom's taxonomy. This is the theory that says our brain learns in stages. And if you want to learn something and, and we're all I suspect everyone in this class or everyone in this session was fortunate enough to actually gone to school and to be actually be educated. You know, you would have remembered something, you would have understood it, and then you would have tried to apply it, assess what happened when you applied it, looked at the evalu evaluate how it worked out, and then eventually, after a lot of application, you would get to, you have mastered something. And why this is important is this basically says you cannot get to mastery without applying your knowledge over and over again until you have mastered it. So with that in mind, there is a structure to a virtual class that we have sort of come up, uh, distilled from talking with a lot of people. There's an important part where you have to build relationships online. You need students to be comfortable to kind of make mistakes and engage themselves. You would review what was going on. It's like some applied activity, preview the class, the main segment, we'll talk about it in a moment. You review, did they learn? You kind of preview what's next. And these gray areas, these activities, if when you get to the main segment, you want to kind of teach and create a scaffolding which people or students can apply themselves and get them to start applying what they just learning. In other words, to climb Bloom staircase to get to mastery. And you would do these in segments, right? We just can't listen to somebody for an hour. That's not very good. It's very much passive learning. Active learning is much better and applying the knowledge better still with feedback. So we came to this conclusion that if you want to make the best, the best use of an applied learning activity, you want students to apply themselves, they expend some effort, they get feedback in terms of like getting them help. And with that feedback, they get to a higher level of understanding, they learn. And we just call this the virtuous cycle of applied learning. And we call it virtuous cycle because the, the state that you're trying to get students into is they realize the more I apply myself, the faster I learn. And in some ways, this is what we used to call, or still call, flipped classrooms. You learn outside the class so you can come into the classroom and apply yourself and get help. So there's another theory behind this in terms of like, well, if you're applying yourself, it's too easy, not really learning, too hard, not learning. There's a zone that if you are in that zone, you can learn while you're applying. And at the bottom end, it's sort of like things that you can learn on your own like by myself with a book or computer, or things you can learn with assistance. And that assistance can come from the teacher or peers in the class. And so you kind of want to get students in this zone during the virtual class, so they're kind of at their optimal level of learning. And that is doing things with each other, and that's constructivism constructs things in your mind. Social constructivism is it with others. And that's the basis for Moodle. So this was the five uh, points of social constructivism that Martin Dugiemis crafted when he built Moodle. That was his theory of the mind in terms of what Moodle was trying to achieve. The key point here is that we're even more so in a virtual class. We're constructing knowledge together when we're applying ourselves and working with each other, like in breakout rooms. Okay, so our North Star, our guiding principle, our theory of the mind for Big Blue Button is that if we can maximize the time that the instructors can have the students apply themselves and give them feedback, maximize time for applied learning and feedback, we are headed in the right direction for an effective virtual class. All right, so I'll talk a little bit about Big Blue Button and how we apply that. So let's take this, this model of what it is to have the virtual cycle of applied learning. And the way I like to say it is now and only now do we talk about features. In the context of what it is for an effective virtual class, we look at how Big Blue Button can help the teacher very quickly maximize time and get students to apply themselves in various learning activities. So the multi-user whiteboards, smart slides, polling, shared notes, reaction breakout rooms, and more. All of these built in, you don't have to go to a third party site, they're all there. As the students apply themselves, they, the application generates analytics. The system knows what students are doing and what we try to do in Big Blue Button is give the teacher visibility in terms of who might be struggling. And the classic example I always think of is if a student's not replying to polls or chat, 
then uh, the teacher could see this in the data and they could say, hey, Sam, it's okay if you don't know the answer. It's important to respond. And Sam would be there like, what? How does the teacher know who I am? I'm not sharing my webcam. Well, we don't rely on webcams. The data will tell the teacher who is active or not. And it's through that they can give feedback and it's through that the students can learn. So some visuals, and I mean, I'm, for many people, this is more for those that may have been listening to this, may not really have visuals with the blue button, but we have really good built-in breakout rooms, which can take the content from the breakout room and bring it back to the main room. Why would you do that? Well, it's important that the students create content and have the chance to come back and present it. So we can have it where it takes the whiteboard and brings the shared notes back. And we're even pushing that a bit further with this one. You'll see something in a demo. Um, we built a really nice whiteboard into Big Blue Button, TL Draw. And this whiteboard uh, also supports multi-user whiteboard. And when multi-user, you can have the students not see each other's cursor. It opens up a whole range of visual assessment that when the students are asked to please point at where Spain is, uh, that they would not be able to see each other's cursors. Another great way of assessment uh, for students, whether they're learning or not. And we built this concept on smart slides, which the content of the slide is already read into memory for screen readers. So we basically parse the content and look for, does this, mm, does this look like a poll question? And here's some answers and we'll give like a single button to do like an ABCDE poll. Again, make it easy for the instructor, save time, increase the amount of applied learning, students have to think, and the feedback is coming from the analytics. And that analytics is what we call the learning analytics dashboard. It is built into Big Blue Button. You can open it up in another tab and it will give you the data updated in the last 15 seconds of what students are doing in the session. Now you could, if your brain was amazing, track all this in real time, be aware when students leave, remember who raised their hand, remember who typed in the chat, remember who responded to the poll. But instead of forcing the instructor, like putting more on them, we just summarize it for them. And from this information, they can decide, maybe the students need to be, uh, maybe you need to shore up the knowledge in one particular point because they, they're missing out on the, uh, the correct answers to the poll and so on. Uh, and one other thing about data, which we work in a demo here, but it actually is underway. Uh, we have XAI, X API support. It's the IMS global or the one class global uh, standard for sharing uh, and user experiences across different learning uh, management tools or learning tools and consolidating them together. And this is for sort of like unified reports. This is being put into the core of Big Blue Button and it will be available as part of an upcoming update to the webhooks. So again, we're really making sure that Big Blue Button is kind of deeply integrated not only with the LMS, but with other systems that would be of use for, uh, for learning. Okay, so that was a bit of the framework of how we think about the Big Blue Button project, how we express that and how it guides us in the development of Big Blue Button. And now I wanna talk about the future. So our strategy is we, we, do, not want, we do not ignore like the fact that most of the sessions which people would use to meet would be a traditional video conferencing system. We kind of wrap ourselves around that. And we want to make sure that we have Big Blue Button. It's literally equal to or better than what other video conferencing systems might provide. And you're going to see some a demo later on of some work that we're doing to even push the video further. So in other words, the, the strategy is you make yourself equal and you differentiate. So a lot of use cases are using Big Blue Button for just those capabilities. We want to make sure they're super solid and we want to differentiate ourselves on the teaching and learning. That's the vision behind Big Blue Button. Like the world needs to provide everyone access to a high quality education. And we believe that we can make the world's platform for doing that. And again, making it open source gives us the, the global reach to achieve it. So uh, I want to share some things that I've heard at the summit. So I've talked around, I've spent a week uh, talking with people from various universities. And so some of the thoughts are, uh, one quote is, some schools have chosen Zoom based on their experience of using Big Blue Button in 2020. So you might remember before Thanos snapped its fingers and we all forgot about it, in 2020 there was a pandemic and none of us would be here together in the room. So Big Blue Button in 2020 is not Big Blue Button in 2023. A lot of people used it, it worked. I mean, Ben Wootenberg, they managed to do amazing things with it. But uh, there were parts where it could have been state more stable and more reliable. Certainly we've gotten there now, but people may still be thinking about us in the framework of 2020. 
That's not the example today. Uh, the company I'm involved with, Blindside Networks, like we did 2 billion minutes of during the COVID. And each month we have hundreds of thousands of virtual classes running our servers. We get very little support tickets. So the product is way more stable than it was before. So there's a perception that we need to overcome. The second is the user interface looks the same as it did in 2020. Um, that's by design. We wanted to make an interface that was modular, kind of scalable. We could add things to it. But it has this perception where because it looks the same, it is the same. And it's time for a refresh in the UI, especially things that kind of grown organically and we think we can do a lot better. The other thing is uh, schools want to use BigBlueButton for more than just teaching. And this makes sense. You don't need to have four video conferencing systems at your school. Ideally, you would have one, and it provides really good video conferencing system and exceptionally good virtual classroom. And that's what we're going for. If we can solve the virtual classroom, by definition, we'll also solve the video because everything you need in video is kind of still there in the virtual classroom. It's just not enough to have an effective virtual class. There's just much more you want to have. And that much more part is what Big Blue Button can differentiate itself on. And also what I've heard is the case for hybrid classes increasing. And this also makes sense. Things have moved back to the physical, but there are still students who should be able to participate remotely. And that opened up during COVID. If it did anything, it got everybody uh, ready or not, here we come to, to be able to do teaching and learning online. And so hybrid classes is going to be a very strong part of the future. So my point here is not just have this mindset, it's virtual classrooms or nothing. If we solve virtual classrooms really well, we solve the kind of traditional meetings. And for virtual classrooms, you do want to bridge in students who are remote, if it's a physical classroom to virtual, the hybrid model. And we can do this. So a few things, like in terms of you'll see in the, in the, in the demos, like stability, uh, it's not 2020, it's 2023 and soon to be 2024. Uh, you'll see a demo of what we're looking at for using LiveKit, it's a potential for a replacement of the back-end media servers. And there's just a lot of testing that go on. Um, Chego, what's the number of tests that we run every every check-in? So in, in GitHub, in the repository, when someone checks in, um, OK, uh, can you zoom in the webcam in a bit more? Do you see that? No? OK, this is, this is who I am. <laughs> All right. Ah, OK, there we go. Awesome. Um, so stability, we do like over 200 tests uh, with every check-in. So there's, there's way more automated tests. Like three years ago, there was zero automated tests. So a lot of work has gone into testing, and a lot more will because we want the core to be solid. It helps us deploy, helps us test, helps make sure the world can adopt Big Blue Button. Um, other use cases, yes. Uh, we want to continue to prove the ease of use, and Tyler will talk about that. And also the plugin architecture will allow us to do it for different types of use case scenarios. The hybrid class, you're going to see a demo on how we're looking to bridge it into the physical classroom. The physical class can actually be joined into a big blue button session. And the user interface looks the same. Well, the, we're going to see some designs of what big blue button will look like in 2024 and beyond. OK, so this I mentioned this core of the platform a bit. If you think of Big Blue Button today, it has everything in it that we have built, everything I've talked about so far. And this core kind of takes care of like security, accessibility, scalability, localization, APIs. It is open source, privacy, distribution. So Big Blue Button, the core Big Blue Button today that you see, has all the capabilities in this. And I think this is where we kind of do what Moodle did. At the beginning, Moodle was a single monolithic application, and then it got plugins. And then things got really interesting because the plugins enabled people to take Moodle in the direction that they wanted to, and it would actually be able to match their needs better. So we are Big Blue Button 2.7 right now. So we're going to get to Big Blue Button 3.0 uh, in the early new year, and that will have the first implementation of plugins. And then you, what we expect to happen as we consolidate the core and simplify, thanks to things like GraphQL, maybe with LiveKit, other capabilities, we expect the core to kind of sh shrink into like a bit more of like a more, um, to become more like the underlying capabilities that you would require, like the localization, the scalability, the security, and that features would move out of the core into a plugin and other features that we would take longer for us to do in the core, 
could be done as plugins. So I want to see a world where they're like, you know, we'll be conservative, like 25 super awesome plugins that are 25 parallel developments that are going on top of Big Blue Button. And then from there, the sky's the limit. Uh, because this is what this is what Moodle did. It was they made themselves into a platform with plugins and it just took off. Okay, so I'm gonna spend a moment just talking about other things in the future and sort of lay some markers down in terms of where we're thinking of the project. So this is the context for Big Blue Button for teaching and learning. You have a front end, a learning management system, and you have a back end, a learning management system. Once you go into Big Blue Button, you leave and go back to the LMS. So there's a couple areas where we can improve Big Blue Button, and one is in integrations. We always want Big Blue Button to look like it's part of the LMS. Like the LMS is missing something that Big Blue Button is not there. And one thing is the LMS is analytics, and we want to pass these into Big Blue Button. So I'll share with you the this is this picture is becoming real. This is what we've been thinking about for over a year. If the LMS knows information about the student that would be useful to the teacher when the class starts. Uh, could the LMS pass along some hints to Big Blue Button that says, I think this particular student uh, you're going to want to pay attention to. So here's an example where uh, a, a little warning sign or a little notification sign would appear. And when this teacher clicks on it, they see, ah, the LMS is telling me that there's two assignments that are missing. And then when they click, there's a link that would take them back to the LMS for additional information. So now it feels like the like Big Blue Button is like helping me out even more. I don't have to remember, I don't have to go manually search. If there's information that's useful in the LMS, it's made available to me so I can teach a more effective virtual class and maybe give some additional support to these people so they realize the teacher is aware of them and cares about them. So number two, uh, the world is moving to where AI is gonna open up lots of opportunities. Some obvious ones would be summarize and index the recordings with AI. So if you accumulate as a school, 1,000, 2,000, 10,000, 20,000 recordings, make them more useful. And uh, Lars will touch base on that a little bit. Uh, he'll be the first one after me. You may take the summaries of those recordings and you may make them available to students as like a question over time. So between the class, let's say one week to the next, maybe the system could send out two emails with like two questions each about, hey, here's a question about what happened in the last class. Question could be generated by AI and vetted ahead of time by the instructor. But what it would do is it would trigger recall of the student about what they learned in the last class. And then by the time the next class comes, maybe that data was available to the teacher to say, okay, there was 50 people in the class. They all responded to these four questions about the last and they all aced them. Time to move on. Let's get on the next class where the foundation is solid. Or maybe there is one of those questions where they completely whiffed and the teacher could just know that, okay, I'm gonna spend a few minutes shoring up that knowledge because I need to build upon it, right? More analytics, more insight, more ability to help the student through the learning journey. You could, during the live class, take the content that's already in the slide, and even if it's not formatted into a poll question, generate one. And so this is what we prototyped earlier this year. So here's an example of a slide on what was the fall of Rome. Uh, the content is there, it's in memory for the screen reader, and we created a button which we, at the time, I think was one of the first things we think about, ah, oh, maybe we could do this as a plugin. But again, this is back like six months ago. So nonetheless, we created something which on the server would send the data, the text from the slide to a large language model with a prompt that says, give me a, a five question poll, or five response poll where one of them is correct. The teacher sees this. And so instead of typing in a poll question on the slide, you just have the computer generate it. And then that looks good. And then you, give it to students and students will see it pop up. You'll see the answers coming back live. It'll be stored for you in the learning analytics dashboard. And this will give you formative assessment with like a single click. Okay, as you keep thinking about this, in a virtual, in a class, any class, physical class, virtual class, not everybody is at the same level, right? We all grew up in a kind of industrialized teaching where you went into a class and the teacher taught probably at the medium. But in an online class, you don't have to teach the medium per se. If you were gonna be generating questions, for example, on the fall of Rome, you could have the AI generate an easy question, a medium one and a harder one. And so if the analytics yield, suggest that hmm, there's some students that are not participating or struggling, you might have them give them the easy question. And then if they get that right, go to the medium one and the hard one. And those students that look like they're crushing it, just give them the hard question. 
this goes back to the zone of proximal development where you like want students to kind of be at the upper end of what their their skills are and that's the most efficient place for them to learn okay um, monitor breakout rooms. So another example would be is, let's say with Big Blue Button, you have them put into four breakout rooms. And let's say that you ask them to type into the into the shared notes the answers to three questions. Uh, give me three reasons why Rome fell. Well, you could visit the sh breakout rooms individually, which I know we know students, teachers do today. But what if there was a language model that was kind of looking at the slot, the text that was put into the shared notes. It knows what the class has been talking about so far. It knows what the slide is. And it could help kind of grade for the or assess for the teacher which of these, uh, like on a score of one to 100, how close the students are getting to what, you know, the answers are probably um, are based on what was the content of the slides or what was talked about so far. The point here is that it could kind of help to guide the teacher that if there was one of the groups that was kind of just not getting it, like nothing in their slides relates to or their shared notes relates to what they were talking about that's probably the one for the teacher to go in and provide some assistance. So again, you're helping the teacher to optimize themselves to give students feedback. Again, going back to the main point. This one we are working on, and I'm really hopeful we'll get it uh, this year. And this is whiteboard vision. This is the idea that you have students and you want them to work on something. We use the whiteboard as a metaphor. And as they're working on it, there's some assessment of which students might be doing well or not. And that assessment guides you to say, hey, this particular student, I think I'm going to help them out for a moment. You click on it, you go into what we call a cone of silence, you're sharing your webcam with the student, the student can hear you, uh, and it's just the two of you. And so maybe for a minute or two, you help that student out over whatever difficulty, and you go on to the next, and you go on to the next. So if you have, during your class, let's say 10 minutes where the students are going to be applying themselves to the flip classroom, and you can help five of those students out who are struggling, those five students are going to they're going to perceive a whole lot more value from going into a virtual class than just passively sitting there and listening as they might have done during COVID. This is the world we should be living in. Okay, so now I'm going to peer even a little bit further in the future. Uh, and this is where I think the world is we're headed. So I think we're all going to have a personal tutor, uh, all the students, everyone in the world through AI will have access to a personal tutor. It, it's already there. It's just that there's some things that are kind of missing from an AI model if you interact with it in a tutoring. But those pieces are gonna fall in and I'll show you how I think they'll, they'll come together. So to understand, let's just take a really simple example. Let's say you want to know something and you don't know anything about it right now. This is something you wanna learn. Through effort, you're going to master it, right? So think about like Bloom's staircase and like what you, you know, when you know nothing and you get to the top, you've mastered it. But to get there, you've got to climb the staircase, you've got to put the effort in, you've got to learn. So if you think of this like a workout, if you think about you're going to learn something, you're going to come back, your brain's going to rest on it, you're going to learn again. This is kind of how it works, right? Over time, as you climb the staircase, you kind of shade in these steps until you get to the point where like, yes, I've, I've remembered it, I've understood it, I've applied it, and now I've mastered it. And it's going to take time, and you do it over a series of workouts. So another aspect of this is our knowledge is hierarchical, right? For you to learn something, you must know the underlying components. I mean, math is probably the best example. How many here have been given a math problem when they were in school? And it's like, I have no idea how to solve this problem, right? It just looks like Greek. Apologies to anyone who's Greek. Um, so what you need is you need to know the underlying pieces before you can attempt this. But what usually happens is you don't know what you don't know. So you don't, let's imagine you don't have all the underlying pieces. You don't know that you don't have them. And so this just looks like Greek. And really what's happened is you are summers along, Bloom's, you know, like learning it, like climbing Bloom's staircase. And if you think of what happened, what would happen if a really good tutor stood, stepped into the room and watched you struggling with this? They would say, they would ask you a couple of questions that kind of assess where you are and their hard field knowledge, like how strong they are. And then you, they would say something like this. Okay, Fred, I understand what you're trying to do. I'm going and I understand the areas that you're weak. We're going to work together. I'm going to shore up your knowledge so that's strong enough that you're going to be able to attempt this problem and solve it. And I will guarantee you this is going to be the most efficient way for you to learn. Like who in the world wouldn't want to have a personal tutor? The point about this is once you understand the hierarchy of knowledge that's missing and the pieces that are missing and where students are, you now can 
basically create a learning, a learning pathway or a learning journey for the students. And this data can help make that learning journey most effective. But now think of this from the point of view of the teacher. There's not just one student in the class. There's 30 or 50, and all of them are in different pathways and different holes in their hierarchy. So this is the challenge that teachers would face. Well, this is, I think, the world we're headed to. And, you know, you could say there's, there's certainly aspects about privacy in this, but I just, I think about this is where the world is eventually getting to. Everyone will have a personal tutor. That personal tutor, an AI, uh, will be designed specifically to figure out the hierarchy of knowledge, where you're struggling, and it will provide, it will generate analytics. The LMS already today generates analytics based on your interaction, your, you know, your quizzing, your uploading of assignments, your grading. And Big Blue Button already generates analytics based on your interaction with applied learning. If all of these systems could share the knowledge so that when you go into Big Blue Button, the teacher could have visibility in terms of where every person is in their learning journey. And the LMS could be aware of this so that it could better craft the contents that's displayed to the, to the user. And that the analytics in the, in the learning and the AI could know about these two. If you lived in the, if we lived in this world, imagine you're a teacher and you're living in this world where you have amazing visibility into where students are struggling and the tools to help them overcome it. And you could do this in a fluid way that just seemed natural. And then you came back to the world we have today. You'd be like, wait a minute, like, how are you doing this? You're, you, I don't have the data which I've come to rely upon to be more effective. And I think this is possible now with AI but only AI and used in a proper way, not just, not just, you know, not just used to say, hey, let me just generate the answer for you. That's not learning. It's like going into a gym and saying, take a look at the weights and uh, just watch them long enough and you'll, you'll get stronger. It's just not how it works. Okay, so the good question, a question to ask is, well, what is the future of the educator if that's the world we're going towards? So I believe that the educator, the teacher, the instructor, the professor, will actually become more of a coach and a mentor. You know, think of a basketball team or any team where the athletes are already got base skills, but you, you wanna mold them together. I think the emphasis is gonna be more on critical thinking skills. Like, I mean, I took an accounting class and what did the teacher do? It just stood up and talked about accounting, showed some problems, but we didn't really do anything. I think that you, I think the, the, there will be a bit more of a shift towards critical thinking skills, not just passing exams. And the reason that's possible is that some of this base knowledge that would have been taught in the class can be taken care of by like a personal tutor. So the class can be, classroom can be more applied. It's like the flip classroom, but really we're gonna make it there. I also believe there's gonna be more emphasis on teamwork. Like the world's problems are not gonna be solved by one individual who says I'm smarter than anybody else. You know, remember, in, I'm sure you all have experience in school, you had that one class that had that one group project and it was just terrible, right? Someone didn't do the work and other people were struggling. Well, welcome to the real world, right? So I believe there's an opportunity to have students with a lot more teamwork skills uh, because they've been working together and applying themselves together, social group or social constructivism. And I also believe the virtual classroom will be even more important and the teachers gonna be more important because humans learn best from humans. Yes, the AI is amazing and can answer questions, but man, at the end of the day, you know, you're always gonna learn better from each other. We, the Big Blue Button Project, are moving to become more of a platform and we see hybrid classes and, and traditional meetings part of the future and plugins is a way that we can adapt Big Blue Button for it. And we want Big Blue Button to encompass different use cases. Again, virtual classes, hybrid classes, traditional meetings as well. And we wanna leverage our community to advance the project in these directions.